Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming down here this evening. Um, for those of you who know me, hello. And for those of you who don't, I'm Dr. Avanti May Rotra. I am the Director of Oncology here at Humphrey Cancer Center. And uh, um, I am a medical oncologist by training. Um, so really, I'm going to take you on a journey through head and neck cancer. It's a pretty uh, expansive thing here, but I've tried to um, put it in a way such that all of us are able to follow along pretty well. A lot of times, patients will actually ask me, what is cancer? Okay. So coming down to what is cancer, cancer is actually a very abnormal cell growth. Most of the times the problem is that there is a lot of growth that's happening, excessive growth of cells, because of which there's accumulation of cells. Now this accumulation of cells can actually be just a benign process. However, there are times when this accumulated cells get the ability to start to invade outside of where they belong, which is what then leads to what's leads to what's called a malignant process, which is essentially cancer. So for pr pretty much, it is an accumulation of cells with invasion of other tissues. The second process by which cancer can develop is a process that the cells actually forget how to die. As a result, they're still accumulating. However, what led to the accumulation is that they have forgotten how to undergo what's called programmed cell death. All the cells of our body have a certain lifespan. They're supposed to live a certain life and then they're supposed to die so that new cells can be born and replace them. When these old cells become so resistant to dying that they forget how to die, that also can result in a certain different types of cancers. What leads to this process of overgrowth or underdying is something of a mutation that can sometimes happen, which is frequently an acquired mutation, sometimes what you're born with. Processes that we are not able to actually repair our DNA. The DNA repair mechanism is a very important repair process that is needed in every cell. And sometimes that gets faulty because of which either the tumor suppressor gene can become inactivated or the tumor causing gene can get activated in our body, which can then finally lead downstream to this entire process of excessive cell growth. The second question that frequently patients will ask, how does cancer spread? And the, pro the concept of cancer spreading can be threefold. First, by direct extension. This is as uh, um, intuitive as it can be. You know, it was the pre cancer was present here, it spread into the nearby structures. Second important way is by blood. We all can understand it very well. It is pre the bloodstream is connected all over the body. It can spread through blood. Then finally, it is through lymph glands. The reason I picked, put the picture of lymph glands over here is simply because this is something that we're all in the general population not very well aware of. Lymphatic channels are basically also connected throughout the entire body. They're pretty much like blood vessels connected all over the body. And along the highway of these lymphatic channels in our body, we have these rest areas, which are the lymph nodes. The lymph nodes populate all over the body from the toe to the neck. And they are, they are the ones that can frequently harbor cancer cells. And then through the lymphatic channels, the cancer can spread to other parts of the body. This is what we are focusing on today, as you all have already seen. You know, this is a part of the head and neck area, the paranasal sinuses, the nose and the nasal cavity, the mouth, the tongue, the back of the tongue, and then finally the throat area, which gets divided into the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the hypopharynx, and not to ignore our voice box. So in general, you've already heard the statistics, 40,000 cases per year, more than 40,000 cases. This year, it is expected that we'll have about 46,000 cases in our country. Expected deaths due to head and neck cancer, 8,650 in one year. Incidence rates, as you have heard already, is higher in men. In general, the rates are somewhat stable, except for the HPV-related cancers, which seem to be growing. Five-year survival, 62%. Ten-year survival, 51%. So all comers, five-year survival is only 62%. This is abysmal. It, it really is a disease that we have a lot of fighting to do. 
And as you can see here, only one third of the cases get picked up in very early stages. And the earlier stages, the five-year survival is 83%. Huge differences. And this is really what we want to try to achieve somehow or the other. Preventable causes in general, when we start to look at all cancers in general, this is a nice list that turns out. 33% tobacco related, 20% weight and obesity related. That's pretty compelling. And then comes down to 3 to 5% range of diet, exercise, occupation, radiation, prescription drugs, all kinds of other things. But 33% tobacco, 20% weight and obesity related. Risk factors for head and neck cancer can be summed up into tobacco use, smoking, tobacco use, chewing, alcohol. And then the two together, bad combination, 30 to 40 times as much. Uh, and of course, we've heard about the HPV, other viruses, which is the Epstein-Barr virus. You got certain other elements that we can think of, you know, asbestos, nickel, chromium, bunch of them. And then comes down to a rare condition called plumber vinson syndrome, which is basically an iron deficiency anemia associated with webs that can be formed in the throat area, which puts people at risk for development of head and neck cancer. So literally, it's basically a condition where we might be genetically predisposed to it, but really the lifestyle is what pulls the trigger. 75%, I can't say this enough. I mean, all of us in this field pas feel passionately about this. The smoking and the alcohol really do need to be cut down significantly. You all have heard about the signs and symptoms, so I won't go into details about this, but basically an ulcer, a patch, a lump, any kind of thickening, any kind of change of voice, ear pain, persistent, mass, or any difficulty swallowing should take you to your doctor in order to get evaluated. Staging of head and neck cancer. I put this slide in there because I really should always talk about staging in my talks. So basically, early stage head and neck cancer is when there is no lymph node involvement. Stage three, you are, have larger tumors and just one side lymph node involvement with one node. For the most part, stage 4A is when you can have tumor of any size, but you have lymph, more lymph nodes involved either on the same side or both the sides. Stage 4B is when it starts to invade locally. And finally, stage 4C is when the cat's out of the bag. You know, it's traveled outside of where it really belongs. So it could be anywhere from the lungs to the brain to the toe to the bone. Treatment team, as you have heard, involves lots of different supportive and various different types of oncologists. So you have your surgical oncologist, the radiation oncologist, and then the medical oncologist, and finally the research and all of our ancillary staff. It is extremely important for speech pathology to be involved. It is extremely uh, important for dietary services to be involved with our head and neck cancer treatment. Systemic therapy. So I'm a medical oncologist. You know, my role comes down to talking about and delivering systemic therapy for head and neck cancer. Systemic therapy basically refers to any treatment that is given system wide. So the goal of the and the, basically the treatment would be given in the form of chemotherapy or else targeted therapy. So these are basically drugs and medications that are given in order to fight the cancer. So we have local treatment, which is with surgery and radiation. And then we have systemic treatment, which helps to reduce the risk of local recurrence and also system-wide all over the body. So chemotherapy, a term that we're all really, really afraid of, it's, these are basically drugs that are used, these are medications that are used to kill cancer cells. They kill good cells too. However, the thought is that the good cells actually grow back while the cancer cells still are dead permanently. Targeted therapy, that is a buzzword nowadays, but basically targeted therapy is therapy that is directed specifically against a specific target that we are able to identify in the cancer cell. So role of chemotherapy in head and neck cancer. This is um, a process that has gone through a lot of maturity. Basically, there are four different types of philosophies for which you can use chemotherapy in head and neck cancer. All right. 
The first philosophy is what's called induction chemotherapy or neoadjuvant chemotherapy. This is basically when chemotherapy is given in order to shrink the cancer down prior to proceeding with a definitive radiation or definitive chemo radiation or definitive surgery. So your final treatment is going to happen later, but you do an upfront initial chemotherapy in order to shrink the things down so as to make the final process more feasible. Second philosophy is what's called concurrent chemoradiation. Concurrent chemoradiation means you're doing radiation treatment and you're doing chemotherapy side by side. And this is basically in the setting of locally advanced cancer where surgery is not possible. So either because of extensive lymph node involvement or due to large sizes or both side lymph node involvement, you can't possibly do surgery. But we can then try to use chemotherapy plus radiation in order to kill the cancer permanently. The third process, third philosophy is called organ preservation technique, which is basically a process utilized in the setting where surgery is not desirable, meaning surgery is possible, but it's not desirable. For instance, if someone has cancer of the larynx, the voice box, we want to try to speak. All of us would, I mean, I would prefer not to lose my ability to speak. And therefore, even though surgery might be possible, we, try, we opt for chemo radiation in order to maintain that organ preservation and its functionality. And the final philosophy is where you do surgery followed by chemotherapy plus radiation. And this is basically done in order to maximize the outcomes after initial surgery has been done, but we find that it's a high-risk situation. So we say, all right, fine. In that case, we need to add in more chemotherapy and radiation or additional treatment after the initial therapy has been completed. So the role of chemotherapy, have we really tested? What if we didn't do it? What if we did do it? So I put forward this meta-analysis. This is basically a a set of 50 trials that were looked at together statistically. 9,000 patients meet and follow up was for about five and a half years. This showed a very large, very large absolute decrease in mortality in five years if chemo was added to the radiation therapy. In other words, if chemo was added to the local definitive therapy. Standard of care, therefore, is a chemotherapy called cisplatinum. A lot of you might be familiar with it. It's basically done for three cycles, once every three weeks. There are other standards as well. One is a combination of cisplatin plus 5-FU. It tends to get a little bit more toxic. And then there are other alternative schedules where we can do weekly small dose of cisplatinum. So it's the same drug, but you just give it in a fractionated manner so as to make it a little better tolerated. So basically, these alternative schedules can be utilized if we think that a person cannot tolerate the high-dose bolus cisplatinum. They're considered a shade inferior, but they're better than not doing it at all. Carboplatin is a cousin of cisplatin that is sometimes used in patients in whom we think that carboplatin, uh, they might not be able to tolerate cisplatin. Most recently, in 2014, we had a trial where we looked at carboplatin and nasopharyngeal cancer, that's back of the nose, and we actually found that carboplatin was almost equally effective, although traditionally all previous trials have never found it to be quite as effective as the cisplatin. Another large intergroup study was an advanced stage 3 and stage 4. Now, you have to understand, st advanced stage 3 and stage 4 is very advanced disease. Radiation therapy alone versus radiation plus cisplatin versus radiation plus cisplatin and 5-FU. Overall survival, 20 versus 37 versus 27%. So 37% versus 20%, that's pretty significant. A large number of patients who were able to save by the addition of the medication to the radiation. Coming to the concept of induction chemotherapy followed by chemoradiation. This is something that actually we used a lot in 1990s. And then through the 2000s, it kind of went down a little bit. And now most recently in 2014, we had a really nice trial which matured. So it's starting to gain momentum again. And we might see a little bit more of it. it does tend to get more toxic. It's a lot more involving. But basically, it is initial chemotherapy for three cycles with three drugs together, and then you go on to doing chemotherapy plus radiation. So it's very intensive and it's very long treatment course, but it did show 
considerable improvement, 58%. I mean, remember that 37% there versus 58%. And in this particular trial, it turned out to be 58% versus 46%. So I think this is going to gain a little bit more momentum as we go forward. Still a little controversial, like I said, but I think it'll pick up. Well, that brings me to what's called targeted therapy. So targeted therapy, as I explained, you know, is therapy that is directed against a specific target. To give an example, this is a head and neck cancer cell. Head and neck cancer cells tend to express what's called epidermal growth factor receptor. Epidermal, meaning related to skin, growth factor receptor. Okay, and when people have an overexpression of EGFR, they tend to grow more. The cells tend to grow more when they have more EGFR. So basically, the cells have EGFR, okay? The epidermal growth factor, we all have this chemical in our body called epidermal growth factor. Now, this growth factor goes and attaches to the EGFR receptor just in this form. It sends the signal down inside the cytoplasm, which then goes inside the nucleus of the tumor cell, and it makes the tumor cell proliferate. It starts to make it grow, okay? So the thought is, if you're able to target this receptor and bind the medication to this receptor, it will in turn result in lack of this growing process. So that's what it came down to the development of this drug called cetuximab and then panitumumab. You guys also might have heard of something called Erbitux. They're all the same thing. Cetuximab is Erbitux. So basically, EGFR activation facilitates tumor growth by increasing proliferation. It also makes the tumor metastasize, in other words, spread a lot more by increasing the motility of the cells and the adhesion of the tumor cells. So the tumor cells become more sticky to other cells of the body. So uh, targeted therapy with weekly cetuximab. So basically patients were taken and half of them were given radiation therapy alone and then the other half were given radiation therapy concurrent with weekly cetuximab. And there was indeed found to be a considerable improvement, 50, 45% versus 55% in the just radiation alone arm versus radiation plus cetuximab. So the local regional control was also found to be superior. So there was a survival benefit and a local benefit. The bad thing about this particular trial, which actually made cetuximab come to light, is that it was never compared to chemo plus radiation. So ideal would have been if there was radiation alone, radiation plus chemo, and radiation plus cetuximab. You know, that's how we would have really compared apples to apples. It is happening right now as we speak. Traditionally, we've thought that it would have a better side effect profile. It really does turn out to be pretty similar as we've gotten more experience with the cetuximab. It does still cause radiation dermatitis, mucositis, oral ulcers. Those still remain an issue. It will, it is presently undergoing trials where we are comparing chemo radiation to cetuximab and radiation. And that in the next three years probably will give us an answer to some degree. Then finally, there is a final concept of what's called palliative intent chemotherapy or palliative intent systemic therapy. Palliative intent therapy is basically when we think cure is not possible, but we do treatment in order to help prolong life, in order to reduce symptoms, in order to avoid the development of symptoms. There are various chemotherapies, including the platinums, taxanes, gemcitabine. These are all different types of chemotherapies. And then we have the targeted therapy, namely the cetuximab, the erlotinib, and a new drug called afatinib. I would really like to see what's called immunotherapy in the head and neck cancer world. And my hope is that over the next five years, we will start to see some immunotherapy as well. Immunotherapy meaning we incite your own body's ab ab ability to be able to fight the cancer. It, is, it has really uh, shown a lot of promise in the other cancer types. And my hope is that in the next five years, it will actually also move into the head and neck cancer world.